You're watching Thorin's YouTube channel. Please seek professional help. It's insane. I still love Game of Sups as much as I do. But is it though? If you think about the factors, it's delicious. Doesn't taste all chemically. You get loads of it in a small container. Doesn't have a load of filler in there. It's actually quite reasonably priced. And obviously you can get 10% off and support me using the code Thorin, T-H-O-R-I-N, at Game of Sups GG. M-I-B-R. No, I'm not Brazilian. Why do you ask? That's why coffee's not really my jam, is it? Or that weird Guarana drink they all have that actually doesn't taste bad, to be fair, but it's just not that great. Game of Sups is where it's at. You know that. It's how you get the hype energy, but also you don't want that horrible crash. Now, funnily enough, I could even make a straight fire reference there to the fact that when it comes to horrible crashes in the game, well, actually, if you don't know, Game Crashes was actually a famous Brazilian brand along with MIBR and G3X way back in the early 2000s. In fact, FNX played for them at one point in time. Did you know that? Probably didn't know that. Anyway, back into this. Thing is, it's still underrated, Game of Subs, just like the player I'm about to talk to about today, talk about today. And the tongue test. That checks out, doesn't it? Because I'm always going to know about the eye test. Well, the tongue test checks out with Game of Subs. I like flavours like lemonade. That's a really refreshing one. Cherry lime, Sokol. Guacamole Game Fight 9000. It's just strawberry and lime. Ignore the edgy name. Uh, Blue Raz, Mango Meta. There's a whole bunch I like. Oh, oh, Arctic Cooler's not too bad. There's a bunch of others, but I'm always scared about which ones are discontinued. Also, they have the Game of Teas, don't they? So you can get the ones that get you going for the day if you just prefer some tea. Like you've got ginger turmeric, which is obviously like a good thing for like your immune system. They've got a nice one at the end of the day if you don't want caffeine. It's got no caffeine and it's got L-theanine. It's called sleepy time. And that one will help you go to bed and get part of your cycle so you can actually get some zids and get some sleep and then come refreshed for tomorrow and be ready for your game of subs and get going in the morning, isn't it? So use code THORIN, T-H-O-R-A-N, at GameSubs.GG. Shout out to everyone who supports me and gets 10% off. Now, the player I'm going to talk about today, I've threatened to make this video so many times because I can't believe that I'm the only person on this bandwagon. Like, I notice when I bring it up, people like Maui on my shows who watch the game, they also agree this player really good but I never see this player being mentioned by other analysts by other people in the scene in fact when people have discussions about like Furia and what should Brazil do and what's Kesarato doing with his career and mm, what are the buyouts like and oh and should Big Azir make a thing all these narratives exist all these ones which rather are all great at narratives but where's the take about how good this player Insane is from MIBR because his name is actually fucking appropriate he is fucking ridiculously good and I can't believe that it just feels like there's no buzz in the scene even when I've tried two or three times on shows and on Twitter to just constantly sort of provoke people to think about this topic and everyone just sort of goes like yeah I guess you have a point there then ignores it and then his name never comes up you'd think he didn't even play in Pro CS the way that, like this guy's playing right now he's in the playoffs by the way of ESL Pro League I never hear him mentioned I never hear anyone rave about him everyone tells me they have a great eye test no no I have the eye test brother I'm the one who could see simpler Nico and, and device from the beginning it's other people who just you have to actually see these guys just like like get the frag on the head and then the game goes victory and then they have to lift the massive trophy and then your brain goes yeah hey, I guess he's really good it's like no 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 you, actually you don't guess he's really good you just used a separate external proxy which is whoever lifts a trophy up or on a list I'm told is good is good that's not actually you figuring out he's good it's just you accepting it based on like the results of a team competition or some sort of like in this case you've picked an expert and they just told you and you said I agree and we'll repeat your opinion if you have an eye test this guy is so fucking underrated it's why I called this video he is the most underrated player just full stop not just in MIBR not just in Brazil he's the most underrated player in the world this is the most underrated player in Counter Strike 2 he might even have been at the end of CS goal the most underrated player that's the thing that's so crazy I mean I know MIBR as a team gets ignored anyway which is legit because they were fairly irrelevant like if you go back a couple of years ago when they had the blast spot that was before he joined by the way yeah, they were just a whatever team. And like, they actually had some okay players, but they didn't have the role set. They didn't have people like Henny at that point. Oh, no, they actually had Henny at that point in time, but then they just had him briefly. They had like Turtle and all them back then. The exit guy was heavily relied upon. It was a pretty flawed roster. And because they had that blast spot, and you knew it was just because they'd paid the money, not because they're actually like a top, whatever it was back then. I think it was... I think it was 12 teams initially and then it expanded now to 16. When there was just 12 teams, teams like them, sometimes OG, especially evil geniuses, these were the ones that were nightmares, weren't they? These were the shit teams no one wanted to watch. But once this guy joined, it was last year onwards, he's been playing the lands. 
this guy's the reason to watch MIBR. I mean, funnily enough, now they've got more reasons. Like, actually, Exit was always pretty legit anyway. Drop does his job. Like, you've got Safe's actually a decent opera in their team. You go look at their team now, beyond, like, IGL, which apparently was the Exit guy at one point in time, uh, or maybe he does it now. Uh, aside from, like, having, like, big Azera or, like, a true, like, world-class IGL, they've actually got the role sort of sorted. So the fact that MIBR has some upset potential doesn't surprise me. Because I, when I've been watching this guy for the last two years, he is so fucking talented at CS. It's crazy. So let's get into it a little bit. Because I have to go first and foremost and just show you some of the stats. Here he is. This is for this year. He's only 20 years old now. In CS2 in 2024. This is for 2024, right? Look at the stats already. They're all bonkers, by the way. Firepower's mega. Look at entering and opening and trading. He doesn't get into many clutch scenarios. There's not that much clutch. Utility's even good, etc. That's over 55 land maps, by the way. Right, first of all, let's go up here. Look at... Like, Deaths is pretty low, considering he's, by the way, an aggressive rifler who on T-side is one of the entry pack and goes in and, like, playmaker style, and sometimes even goes in first and takes the aim duel. He's a very confident player around his aim. So Deaths being this low is very impressive. And then the kill, look at the KPR. He averages 0 0.75. And then if you want other things, ADR is very good, impact ratings mega, overall ratings very good. You go down to here, and this is a subtle point that might get lost on people, which is... He's only been playing land for a couple of years, right? So you go down here and you look. He's mega against all levels of opponent except top five opponents, where he's only played seven maps and he only averages a 1.02. Now, first of all, he is playing the kind of like aggressive rifle role where against the best teams, it's going to be really hard. But secondly, there's actually like a counterintuitive point about how players conceptualize themselves and their opponents. That makes perfect sense of this. This doesn't actually suggest, as you might naively initially read it, as like, oh, he's amazing against like bad teams. And then even against just top 10 opponents, he just farms the bad players. But then when he plays real teams, they shut him down. Now, I would actually argue he probably shuts himself down. If you ever watch this guy's POV, Thomas, I'd suggest you go put in insane e POV. There's loads of them on YouTube. They're really impressive, by the way. When you go and watch one, what you're going to find out is he plays, he doesn't play like abusively off his aim, where it's only off his aim, like old Scream or a guy will stop people like Issa did this, etc. He actually, or Strengths and Quake, if you want an old school reference to a different game. But I actually think he does play fairly smart around off angles and off his aim. And he, he likes to have information on where someone is and they don't know where he is yet and hold an angle. But the point is, he definitely does play very confidently around his aim though. He does take a lot of big aim duels. He'll even take the wide swing aim duel out in the open sometimes because he does win them the majority of the time. I'm telling you, it's crazy. So that type of a player, believe it or not, it will actually take a few years on land playing the absolute best teams and players to get past that aspect because what happens is they're so used to always being to essentially win through skill or hands or mechanics or aim or talent that they can always use that as a go-to and as a crutch whereas I actually think if you watch the other parts of this guy's game and actually how smart he can be and it actually is poisoned the lurky aspects of when he'll like rotate on CT side and once he gets into an aggressive position on T side how he'll just stay on that those that position and use all the different off angles etc and draw people into fights I actually think he's going to get past that I think if you put him either on a better team or give him a little bit give him three to six months more experience at tier one and he'll level that up and then he'll just be bashing the best players in the world by the way because this guy can win so many fucking game jewels like if you want to talk about raw aim on the screen with the eye test I'm not joking this guy's top 20 in the world maybe top 10 he's it's actually bonkers how skilled he is I'm being serious so there's that aspect right there then when you want to go, let's just look at the events and you'll see. So for this year, as you can see, mega. Look at the number. Ignore the rating. I don't give a fuck about that. What I want to look at is look at the kills per round. So you go back. This must be the RMR. Let's have a look. Yeah, this is the RMR. But it was LAN, remember? It's all LAN. So at the RMR, he was just fragging well. Then he went to that tournament, which was all Brazilian teams, which you might go, but who cares about Brazilian teams? No, no, in the modern day, you can go like four or five names deep in Brazil and they're good. Think about what Red Canids is doing now. They wouldn't even be beating people's top three or four. Think about, you've got Furious all right. You are, I don't know if they were that tournament, I can't remember. You have Imperials actually pretty legit. Pain's not bad because of big Azera. MIBR can do some upsets. And then you've got what, Red Canid? You know what I mean? You go deep, you have Imperials. There's all a bunch of squads. So actually, these were essentially like top 30 teams playing there at lower end. And he was farming them. He was fucking mega. Then you go to ESL Challenger Melbourne that they won. Look at the fucking KPR. Admittedly, on this one, he's just farming whoever, isn't he? Like, Apex wasn't that good at this point in time already. But you can see what bonkers stats are. He was unbelievable in almost every game, basically. Then you add the first Bet Boom Dacha Belgrade, the one that was... 
um, earlier in the year. That one, he's also mega. Remember, these are real teams at this tournament, by the way. Like, watch. We'll click on this for a second. He's playing Heroic twice when they'd gotten Dexter, I think. Is this when they'd gotten Dexter in? Yeah, when Dexter just joined. This might even have been one of the first times he joined. They played Heroic twice and then Aurora, who's all right. Then he had the Yon Shipping one, where he wasn't that great. He did badly at Esports World Cup. Then he was really good again at IEM Cologne playing. It's not his fault. And then at Pro League, he's, he's cooking. He's just good. Then you go back and look at last year, and you can already see it last year. Like last year's Katowice played, he's godlike. He's fucking unbelievable. At Pro League, yeah, he had a bad performance. Then you go here, he's all right at the America's RMR. Then he had a really bad IM Rio. Okay, that's a tough one, isn't it? But at the end of the day, it's like his second, his third actual LAN. It's his first one in Brazil. Before this, he wasn't playing LAN, if you don't know. Game of eight, he did badly. Pro League, he's all right. This Brazilian tournament, he dominates. He's not bad at parry, please. Yon Shipping, he's doing all right. And then he starts cooking towards the end of the year. That's why this year I've been following him heavily. It's like the latter part of last year onwards. I started researching because I was trying to think who are the players because I was going to make like the Brazilian super team video I was making late last year. Like who could even be on that? And I was looking up when I watched the POVs, the POV instantly made me like, I'm sold on this guy. This guy's just too fucking good, bro. He's actually just too good. Then you go and look at how he works in his team. So this is just overall on land this year. Insanely, right? He has a really good rating, mega kills, great kill death minus differential over 55 maps. This is all good stuff. You go and look on T-side, by the way, he is just the man. Look at this fucking... This guy is the reason you win on T-side. He's just bonkers. By the way, this is even a good lineup of players. Like I said, look like he even dropped us decently on T-side. On CT-side, he's still the best player, just not as crazy in terms of kills, which is mad because, by the way, his silenced M4 is fucking insane. Like, his bursting, his tapping, his spray for the first 10 bullets, it's really impressive shit. And if we go to opening kills and we go T-side, he's at a solid 25% because he's playing aggressively and he's getting 44.4% success rate. By the way, on CT side, he wins the majority of the opening fights he takes, and he takes the most. He's also a guy who's very willing to play a confident initial contact type position on CT. Then he plays off the angle and uses his talent to actually kill people. This guy is just really fucking good. I actually find it crazy he didn't have the, the buzz because, like I say, this guy is what will tell you if someone's eye test is good. I personally think my eye test is one of the best. I've just watched the game longer than everyone else. I've studied the game a long time. I've talked to all the great players. I've even been able to compare and contrast between all the regions. And I used to just be a POV demo nerd. I used to watch them all in 1.6. I had a massive collection of them all. I wasn't just watching the HLTV. I always make this point. Until CSGO, I always used to wonder, how can people know so little about the players? Because I took it for granted that we didn't used to have straight back then with observers we used to go into it wasn't go tv it's called hltv a client where we were the observer we could pick any pov and i used to just go in there and pick the povs i wanted to watch and swap between people on the on the 1v1 so i can see who's going to win it and who's got the better angle and stuff and i always used to think like you're not getting how does everyone else not know what these players tendencies are what they do and what role they play and i realized if you just watch on stream you're really just like on the reels like a roller coaster ride listening to commentators telling you whatever and so in the same ways if you watch a ufc fight if someone like like Joe Rogan just messes up and gives you the wrong type of commentary or is a bit biased, you will leave with the framing that that, play, that guy was winning the fight. Whereas actually, if you'd watched it without that and you'd just be an expert MMA, maybe you'd notice, oh, he's actually overrated that. Like you wouldn't have heard that aspect and you'd just judge the fight accurately. So I think some of that is the problem when people watch in the modern day. So for me... This guy, his skill set is really, really strong and impressive. Like, his tapping and his burst aim with a rifle is fucking bonkers. He's not only mega with the AK, and by the way, if he misses on the tap of the burst, he just sprays, and he's got one of the best first 10 bullet sprays in CS, I'm telling you. Like, this guy's aim is just fucking crazy. Like, first of all, he has sick headshot aim. It just goes, the first bullet goes straight to the head. In fact, he even does that crazy thing where he doesn't even start spraying on the away and then drag it onto the head he goes almost instantly to the head and then sprays and then pulls down but he hits so many times the first bullet or first two or three bullets it looks like he wasn't going to spray it but he clearly was it's just he also has that knee core thing where the second that he gets the kill he stops he doesn't actually like over spray or have, take a second to like clock in like oh that's there like if you don't know by the way that means you're not going off the animation that says like the obituary like you killed the person that means you yourself have such like a, a, a sick precision and ability with your eye 
to just instantly see a bit like when a tennis uh, sh shoots a shot or a golf person shoots their shot and they can sort of roughly already tell or a basketball player can see that oh that's going in he, he has that he has that neat cool quality where he can just do the tap and he knows it's a kill he can stop immediately so he has some really crazy clips it's why it's actually really hard when he's on CT side with M4A1S to actually like go one by one into his position like he will not only reposition but he will brutalise your players on it peak after peak after peak They're every shot's to the head it's fucking crazy then after his tapping and bursting his spray like I say is really fucking good it actually reminds me if anyone knows the reference back in 1.6 what Forrest's spray used to be like where again it looked like is he just doing like a five bullet burst is that even a thing surely normally you burst like two or three bullets and you pull down really hard on the third like by the way people like Donk are unbelievable at that type of spray too but you can actually tell what he was doing was spraying he just has such accurate spray because Forrest has fucking crazy mechanics that he's just getting the headshot on the fourth or fifth bullets making it look like a really extended burst when actually it's a full auto spray it just never had to go to the full sort of like dragging it all the way down and doing that bit at the bottom with the crosshair it's just getting the kill immediately he has that quality and he is really accurate in those first 10 bullets when he sprays so I, I have to stress how good this guy's aim is. Like, unironically, this guy's nickname should be like Brazilian aimbot. Like when I watch Keir Serato, it's super sick because it's like, it's a bit like Nico. It's like, it's so clean. It's so smooth. It's so, it's so like every movement of the mouse is so on point. Of course it should go to the head. Of course it should be a kill. There's like a human quality to how amazing Nico and Keir Serato are. But when I watch this guy, it actually does remind me of, he's like a Brazilian donk because like the speed, but also that in insane precision with which you just hit the snap headshot like genuinely it looks like an aimbot if you took that off and this was like you went back in a time machine 10 years everyone would think this guy has to be using an aimbot he's just too fucking good like it's too precise it's too snap straight to the head lock on and then get the kill by the way as a result of how good his first bullet is you can imagine his pistols are pretty fucking spicy too there's also a weird angle I noticed from watching his POVs which is he actually does that thing where he must have a bind to change which hand is view like the gun model is on left or right and so when he goes on to what would be like a right side peak he'll switch his gun model to the left side and then sometimes keep it like that for a round or two and then his standard is to have it on the right side though which is just a weird idiosyncrasy he seems to have in his game by the way this guy you can tell his teams and he knows how good he is because this guy plays some of the really big fragger spots on CT side too like this is the guy who plays outside and is never fucking picking an AWP up by the way and he is just murking people with a rifle like he's prime Nico electronic rain it's, it's fucking really really good here he plays connector on Mirage and actually he plays it even a little bit more passively than some people do he likes to play back in the connector because he's going to win that mid-range duel every time with the guy who's going catwalk if a guy comes from lower he's going to instantly headshot them he's really good at playing because of how good his like precision headshot aim is on the very outskirts or the tops of smokes or spots like if you watch him on vertigo on ct side when he plays in the b bomb site he is so good when they try to jump up when they come up those stairs on that little wooden thing if they pop their fucking head up he will pop that head that is how sick this guy's aim. it's almost like by the way his aim style and firing style makes him born to play the B site on Vertigo he is so insane he's one of those players who for real can just sh shut down the first two or three people if then they come when they come to the top of the stairs then if he has a CT push up with him and they sort of go down by the way in the future I'll have demos and I'll just show you the stuff as I'm talking but you can paint the picture in your mind and go look at the POVs yourself if you go, like, go look up the one where he played Vertigo against um, against the Rock it might even have been at Bet Boom go look up that one he's fucking sick on it if he also pushes down with a CT like he has support and they push down the stairs to cover that angle right out of spawn for the tees he is so many highlight clips of him just killing two to four people there they can't get past him bro that range that medium range when he sprays I'm telling you he has some of the best spray and couch strike it's really fucking crazy and as I said before he is very confident in how he plays with his aim but He's not an idiot. He's not just a press W player who's just running in there. Lol! It's not like old school's Antares 10 plus years ago. This guy also has like a bit of nouse to him and a bit of sort of like understanding of like when to settle down a little bit and let the game come to you. And so he actually will also hold and play around angles and actually a win that's, I think it's actually like, it shows experience beyond his years. And so even though, like I say, on CT side, he likes to take a duel and be like a point of contact for a duel and take an aggressive angle. But after that, he will play super lurky around 
around that to get the next kills to make the other T's like second guess themselves on whether they can trade for that guy with and come out. By the way, this guy's a nightmare also because since his spray is so good in the first 10 bullets, you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. If you peek one by one, he'll just win the aim duel against you one by one and headshot both of you and you'll look fucking stupid. And if you peek together, he'll just spray and kill both of you sometimes or kill one and do like, you know, 78 damage to the other a la donk, which is why these guys are just too good with their fucking spray. So I think this guy just should be on Furia. He's just so fucking good. I'm not joking. Aside from Keserato, Keserato's actually had a hard couple of months at this point in time. This guy is the best Brazilian player. I'm telling you, he's that fucking good. Like, if I'm making a Brazilian super team tomorrow, here's my redo on that whole one I did before, which is it starts with Keserato, of course. Just got the legacy. I actually think already his body of work's one of the best ever from Brazil in any version of Counter-Strike. So you start with Keserato, but Keserato doesn't even have to be like your entry type play. It can be a bit lurky, right? So I've got Keserato. I'm taking in Sir Insani immediately as sort of a playmaker, aggressive rifle. I showed you already some of the numbers. With those two players already, by the way, I'll take those two rifles riflers against what any other two riflers in the world so you want to go to vitality now they're going to say he was a rifle but we know he's supposed to warp so if we're saying it's flames and spinks it's not that big a mismatch i'm telling you you just can't conceive it yet because now you think of Splains as a really, truly world-class player because of all those finals and semis understandably he's learned, earned that status but this this guy's mechanics are up there. You go and think of the other ones. Like, look, maybe it's not the best time ever to pick like Rops and Frozen or whatever. Rops is still getting back in a form. Who else would you even go with? Obviously, you have Donk, but then who's the other rifler? You're not taking Shiro because he's the Orpus. So you're going with Zontix. By the way, that's already better. In theory, Keserato and Insane is better than Donk and Zontix. Yeah, it's a bit of a push because Donk is so insane. It sort of counters anyone. But I'm serious. You go through the top 10 teams, you're not going to find players with two riflers better than the ones I just listed, Keserato and Insane. Then if you think about it, if I wanted to fill out the roles. Well, the hard thing was Orpa, right? Because I was just going to go with safe from his team, MIBR, because he's a good player. He's not an exceptional Orpa, but he's good. And actually in that team, he fits the role of Orpa. But actually, I've got to say, if you watch like Red Canids, you just take Henny in it. Henny, ever since he came to Fury and Beyond, just been really good. He just has some weird thing where now apparently it's not even him. It's not him that doesn't want to play and doesn't want to play in top teams and wants to just play with his brother. Apparently it's just the teams have lost interest in him and now he's all the way down the hierarchy. Fucking Red Canids. Like, Henny looks really good and it just seems like he actually sadly should have had a renaissance of like a latter half of his career where he made up for the for the ills and the flaws of the first half where he was overrated and he whiffed a lot of shots despite firing them very quickly then if you wanted like a role player this already in MIPI is called drop he's just a good player and then assuming I can take anyone I've heard Big Azira has offers he just won't move look he can take Exit who's in MIPR too we can essentially just put Henny instead of safe and then bring Keserato instead of I don't know Branson or whatever it is in this team but the obvious angle would be Big Azira because he could frag as an IGL. But if you can't go with him as well, I mean, there's loads of other angles. We can go with Vinny if we want him. We could keep Exit, who's on this team. Exit's a good fragger. Vinny's more the support of IGL. But if you had Big Azira, imagine that team. Big Azira, IGL, drop support. Henny, Orpa, Keserato, Lurker. And then Insaney is my aggressive playmaker rifler. I think that team's fucking bonkers already. Like, I think that for real is a top 10 team right there. In fact, the issue with the Brazilian scene in general is it just doesn't work on any level. So you have Payne has like Big Azira, but they don't have skulls anymore. And it's kind of like, oh, well. Then you have what? Like Red Kinnitz has Henny and Cold Zira, but not much else. I mean, the odd up-and-coming player. Then like Lukowski's supposed to join Payne or whatever it is, but hasn't yet. And he's a good player. And why wasn't he in years ago? Then you have Imperial has like Vinny and a couple of younger players who are on the way up, but they haven't quite made it yet. Then you have Furia has Keserato. Yuri's sort of getting back there. Fallen scoffed as fuck. Tello's all right like you just look at these lineups and you're just like what's going on because furia can't get the best players it's not like the scene's dominated by furia the lower teams can never make a team together mibr has got everything except a top igl some of the players have only got the igl some of the players have only got the open and they're not the sportive elements like it's just such a mess so as a result if you actually look at it right now the real problem with the brazilian scene is you either can't get the, these players to the top teams or they cost like eight bazillion dollars to do so and you waste your fucking money on fallen or even worse they just stay in their orgs and they never make these super teams like MIBR people stay in MIBR Pain people stay in Pain and Imperial people stay in Imperial like where's the Zevi guy we're asking where's all the Orpas these people are out there they get they get going and then we never put them in the top teams and then we just go where are they all I mean at least now people don't know where the rifle is because as I'm sure with Insaney rifle is the main fucking thing aggressive rifler is the number one position in Brazilian Counter Strike what they lack is Orpa fucking support player and IGL the more thinking roles or in terms of Orpa a role that in the modern day you can't just leave to their own devices you have to play it around them you have to set them up you have to have the flashbangs for them you have to cover them you have to create the platform from which they can perform a la the quarterback in the NFL you can't just give him no pocket and then go why are you throwing the deep ball it's like I haven't got any fucking time that the edge rush is right on my face 
immediately because I've got no one blocking for me. So, yeah, you've got to think of that angle. So, I think right now, you could already, right now, if I was allowed to change the rosters and do a Brazilian shuffle, I'm telling you, I could make, I think, four Brazilian teams in the top 20. I'd have to remix for Europe, but I think I can make four Brazilian teams in the top two. So I would have the most of any one country from Brazil, or maybe Russia would be in there. I'm not sure how many teams account as Russia at this point. Aside from Russia, which is kind of the outlier of the greatest crop of the last few years, it would actually be Brazil, believe it or not. More than any, more than Sweden, more than any other country, more than Denmark, all that jazz. Which, by the way, imagine five, six years ago saying you could have more Brazilian lineups than Danish teams in the top 20. It would have been inconceivable. And if you actually let me, like, for real shuffle, as in I can make the best rosters, I'll make you two rosters that can be top 10 two and this one I'm talking about with Keserat went to I think that could be top five by the way that could, that's a team that would be like a dark horse to win all the big tournaments so look he still has to get into more playoff settings then do it there he still has to learn to play more against top five ranked teams and the best players in the world but if you look at how this guy is tracking remember he's only been playing the lands for two years it's 2023 and now 2024 not even two full years he's been playing the lands and this guy already is short he's had the odd bad land that's it but you watch overall, consistently, the skill set is very, very high. And I think the eye test just checks out on this player. Like, this player will be the next Keserato from Brazilian CS, assuming he continues on, he gets more chances, and hopefully gets a better team. Everyone needs a support network, and mine is, of course, my Patreon community, the Screw Minority, who, in many ways, they're the Sonny to my share, saying, I got you, babe. So, this video and all the others on my channel were kindly supported by the following names. Ahmed Aju, Matt Pugnaccio Racula, Adam Tomlin, Animosity, Jensen Go, Tosh, Toucan, and you know it. Jerky's minion, my main man, always going to be referenced, one of the best patrons of all time. Would you like to ask a question in my AMA? Maybe you want to suggest a topic or a guest to see on my channel? Do you want teasers to find out who the upcoming Reflections and Talk to Thorin interviews are? Maybe you want to do one of those long discussions where you get to set the topics we talk about. Well, if any of these or others appeal to you, put your money where your mouth is, join the Scaluminati today via the Patreon link in the description box below.